Welcome to the presentation of the applicability of the load separation criterion in J testing of polymers, the effect of the specimen size. First off, I would like to give a short introduction about elastic plastic fracture mechanic testing in polymers. Polymers often behave quite ductile and non-linear, as you can see on the right hand side. Uh, and this, of course, necessitates the use of elastic plastic fracture mechanics. But since we want to use fracture mechanics to also characterize later on the behavior in different specimens or sizes or even uh, components, of course, we would like to know what is the influence of the exact specimen size or the component size on the fracture behavior. Now, before going into the actual topic of the presentation, I would just uh, point out a few restrictions we encounter when dealing with fracture mechanically testing polymers since a uh, few people here might not be also familiar with these restrictions uh, in polymers. So first of all, for example, we cannot use a potential drop method since the resistance of the polymers is too high. Additionally, we cannot apply a classic load and unload method because our materials are highly time dependent, as you can see here on the right side, uh, which shows a load unload behavior of uh, polypropylene. And as we can see, we have a highly nonlinear and hysteretic behavior of the material, and therefore the results depend highly on the unload and loading rate and usually do not provide reliable results. Therefore, we can also not use this approach. And subsequently, the most established method for chain to go testing of polymers is the multi specimen method. There are several approximation methods, such as uh, the method from Bagley and Landis, Sons and Turner, or Mackey and Thornton, and there are even some standards and recommendations on how to perform tests, such as the ASTM T6, T6, TH, or the ECS T6 4 procedure. However, all of these methods depend on the definition of the correct value of the correct advancement delta A on the fracture surface uh, post mortem, so after the testing. If you have a uh, polymer, for example, like ABS that behaves quite nicely with regard to the correct propagation, it is quite easy to determine this delta A value correctly. However, other polymers, such as, for example, polypropylene, make it more difficult to actually determine or discern the exact level of crack advancement on a fracture surface. For example, here shown on the second picture or even worse on the third one here, where it is quite hard to determine the exact value of delta A. So you can see it is quite difficult to determine delta A for some polymers. And therefore, the question now is if it is possible to use the method uh, to determine fracture parameters of the polymers without the need to actually determine the value of delta A post-mortem or the fracture surface of the specimen. And one method that aims to do so is the so-called load separation method. The load separation method is based on the load separation principle, which was first proposed by Ernst and later on was developed by Cheryl Bean and Landis. Now the load separation principle states that as long as you have the same material, the same geometry and the same level of constraint, you can split the force P recorded in a fracture mechanics test into these two uh, independent functions j, the geometry function, h, the material deformation function. Now, if you do this for two different specimens, for example, a sharp notch and a blunt notch specimen, and you compare them at the same level of plastic displacement, you get the so-called load separation curve, SSP. If you then plot SSP as a function of the plastic deformation, you get a curve that usually looks something like this with three different regions, one, two, and three. And most interesting for us or for the determination of fracture parameters are then region two and three. Region two, you uh, get the blunting process in the sharp notch specimen and uh, plastic deformation in the blunt notch specimen. Uh, and therefore you get this nice plateau here. As soon as you deviate from the plateau, this indicates that something changes in the geometry of the specimen. For example, you get crack growth. Now, this also means that you could use this deviation from the plateau to determine a uh, fracture initiation value. 
for a critical inplastic limb and then you can also of course determine your K1 value for this plastic deformation value. And you get a pseudo fracture initiation value J1 limb. Additionally, you can normalize the curve with the plateau value itself and then have a look at the slope in the third region which then uh, gives an indication of how much plastic deformation is necessary to advance a crack through this material. Now this gives us uh, the chance to use this load separation method and the two values J1 limb and MS as uh, fracture parameters which we can later on use uh, to compare materials without the need to actually determine delta A on the fracture surface. But the question is of course uh, how good is the reproducibility and the repeatability of this method to determine fracture parameters and therefore ESIS started a round robin test and we have the results of six laboratories here where we can compare the values of MS and J1 Lin. And as we can see, the reproducibility and repeatability is quite all right, especially for MS, which gives you a very high degree of reproducibility and repeatability, whereas J1 Lin also gives quite similar results, but is more prone to scheduling. So these results from the round robin test show that the values J1 Lin and MS uh, appear to be quite nice values in uh, regard to the repeatability and reproducibility. But the question now is, um, what happens with those values if we uh, scale up the geometry, for example, test bigger or smaller specimens? There are already some studies with regard to, for example, different strain rates or temperature influences, or also some studies where they use the same specimen and change the thickness of it to determine the influence of uh, the, the size of the specimen with regard to the thickness. But what about the, uh, the case if, for example, we keep the geometry itself constant, so the ratios between different geometry values, such as the width and the thickness and the initial crack length, we keep those constant and just make the specimen bigger. What happens then with those values? So, for example, if we use a single edge span specimen like this, and just increase the overall size without changing any other uh, influences such as the ratio between different geometrical values. And exactly this question now finally leads us to our experimental work and our results. So to start off, I would like to show the uh, specimens we used and the scale-up we used to determine the geometry dependency of J1 Lin and MS. As I said before, of course, we can use, for example, single edge notch pen specimens uh, and keep the ratio constant and just increase the overall size. And this is what you can see here on the left hand side. So we scaled our SEMD specimens, here shown the front notched specimens, not the sharp ones, uh, from a W, so the width of the specimen, from 5 millimeters up to 50. And then we recorded, of course, for both blunt and sharp notch specimens, the load displacement curves, as shown here, again, for WS5 up to 50, in order to determine the load separation curves later on. So, based on these load displacement uh, graphs we recorded for each individual test, we then constructed the load separation curve for all sizes, ranging again from W5 to 50, and had a look at both J1 limb values and the parameter MS. And what we can see here already on the first graph on the left hand side is that clearly there are some differences between the J1 limb and MS values of the different sizes. And first we thought maybe this is just a simple geometry, geometrical uh, scaling issue and therefore we also had a look at the parameters uh, if we normalize the plastic displacement by the size of the specimen, as you can see here on the right hand side, with the displacement uh, scaled with the dimension of the specimen, but still there are clear differences between the J1 limb and MS values of the individual tests. And if we have a look at the exact values of the slope MS and the pseudo initiation fracture J1 limb, we can see here on the left side and 
for MS on, on the right side for J1 lim that we are clearly dependent on the actual specimen size W between 5 and 50 millimeters. And of course, this uh, gave us quite a task to think about where this uh, dependency is coming from. And so this leads us to the conclusion and outlook with regard of the load separation method and its use to determine fracture parameters in the future. Um, we have seen from the round robin conducted by ESIS in uh, former years uh, that the reproducibility of the load separation parameters j and MS are quite good as long as we test on the same uh, specimen geometry and specimen size. However, if we scale the specimens, we see that there is a significant influence on J1 limb and MS depending on the size of the specimen. So, for example, ranging the W of a single echelon span specimen between 5 and 50, as done in this work, we can see quite significant influence there. Now, at the moment, our best guess is that this has, of course, to do with some effects of the level of constraint which are different for the different sizes of the specimens, even though we have the same uh, scaling ratio and material itself. And this leads me to the outlook of our current work. Uh, what we're currently doing is to evaluate the influence of level of constraint uh, by using the material T-curve, and we would then have a look into further scaling possibilities to actually use this approach uh, later on also, for example, uh, in component design, in fraction mechanical component design. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation with some acknowledgement, of course, to my co-authors. If you have any further questions regarding uh, our work, of course, you can reach me at my email address. And if you would like to further read up on this work, our paper was just published in Polymer Testing. And of course, I would like to thank all the funding agencies which made this uh, work possible. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope I can answer some of the questions later on in our discussion.